G'day everyone, and welcome to week four of LA 3006 Administrative Law. This week, we're going to start looking at the errors of law which are found in the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act 1977. In other words, we're going to start looking at some of the rules that decision makers have to follow when making administrative decisions. This week, we're going to look at those rules which fall into the category sometimes referred to as narrow ultra vires and sometimes referred to as jurisdictional errors of law. In this first video, we're going to start by looking at those terms and just exactly what they mean. Let's start with narrow ultra vires. Now look, some lawyers love using Latin. Personally, I think it gets in the way of communication. What's the use of using words other people don't know? But you do hear the term ultra vires from time to time. Ultra, in Latin, simply means outside or beyond. So an ultrasound refers to sound beyond the limits of human hearing. Ultraviolet light is outside the violet end of the visible spectrum. In English, we sometimes use the word ultra to mean extreme, for instance, if we describe something as ultramodern. But even there, it really means beyond modern. Vires means strong or powerful. In modern English, someone who is strong is described as virile. Someone who has strong ethics has virtue. So bringing them together, ultra vires means beyond power. A person or an organisation acts ultra vires if they're doing something which is beyond their proper power. In administrative law, we split ultra vires into two subcategories, narrow and broad ultra vires. Narrow ultra vires asks, does the decision maker have the power? So, narrow ultra vires is not concerned with how well the decision maker follows the process, and it's certainly not concerned whether they make a good decision. A decision maker might follow all of the processes and make a crackingly good decision, but if they don't actually have the power to make any decision at all, then their decision is invalid. So, narrow ultra vires refers to any error of administrative decision making where the decision maker lacks the authority to make their decision. Jurisdictional error of law is almost an identical concept to narrow ultra vires, almost. But I want to tell you up front that many students struggle to understand jurisdictional error. So if this takes you some effort, that's a okay. I want you to imagine a parent who has two children, a 15 year old and a 10 year old. The parent has to go out for a couple of hours, leaving the two children at home alone. Now at law, a 15-year-old is perfectly able to supervise a 10-year-old. The parent put the older child in charge, but says, if your little brother wants to turn the TV on after midday, then you can let him, as long as the show he wants to watch is suitable. Now that's a decision-making power, isn't it? The older child will have to decide whether the show that the younger child wants to watch is suitable. But the older child can't just make that decision. Two conditions have to be in place first. First, the younger child has to ask. This is the household equivalent of somebody making an application. If the younger child decides they're having too much fun kicking a ball around in the backyard, then the older child's views about the suitability of TV shows is irrelevant. Until there is an application by the younger child, the older child has no jurisdiction to decide anything. Second, it has to be after midday. If the younger brother asks for the TV at 11.30, the older child has no power to say yes. doesn't matter if the show's suitable or not. The decision-making power of the older child doesn't exist yet. Again, the older child doesn't have jurisdiction. A jurisdictional error of law happens whenever somebody tries to make a decision and they don't have the power to make it. We're going to look at four types of jurisdictional error of law and we'll start by building them on that family scenario we just discussed. The first type of error occurs if the enactment doesn't provide the power to make the decision at all, ever. In this case, mum was the legislature 
the power to decide the suitability of the TV show existed because she made up the rule. Second, if the enactment sets out a procedure to enliven the decision-making power, the procedure must be followed or else the decision falls into error. So if the younger kid doesn't ask to watch TV, the procedure doesn't get followed, and so the power to decide the suitability of the TV show doesn't actually arise. Third, who does the enactment give the power to? Mum gave the power to the older kid. If the older kid delegated that power and told the 10-year-old to watch whatever he liked, the 10-year-old's decision would have no validity. He just doesn't have the power to make the decision. Fourth, there may be another precondition, not a procedure, but some other condition which needs to be present to enliven the decision-making power. In this case, the precondition was the time. Until midday, even if there was an application by the younger kid, and even if the show was suitable, there was no power for the older one to make a decision. Let's bring it back to the law. Jurisdictional error of law occurs if, one, the decision is not authorised by an enactment at all, two, if the decision maker was not authorised to make the decision, three, if a procedure had to be followed before the decision could be made and the procedure was not followed, and four, if some other non-procedural condition had to exist before the decision could be made, and that condition did not exist. In any of those cases, the decision maker does not have the power to make the decision. They lack jurisdiction. If they try to make a decision, it will be tainted by jurisdictional error. In Hossein against the Minister for Immigration in the High Court, Chief Justice Kiefel and Justices Gagler and Keane said, Jurisdictional error refers to a failure to comply with one or more statutory preconditions or conditions to an extent which results in a decision lacking characteristics necessary for it to be given force and effect. To describe a decision as involving jurisdictional error is to describe that decision as having been made outside jurisdiction. The next question, of course, is why any of this matters. For a long time, this was just a technical distinction. Few people genuinely cared about the difference between jurisdictional and non-jurisdictional error. But then, in 2001, the Tampa incident happened. It seems like yesterday to me, but it's before most current undergraduates were even born. More than 400 asylum seekers were making their way towards Australia in a rickety wooden boat, which began to sink. The Tampa, a large container ship, responded to their distress call and took everyone on board safely, then made for the nearest land, the Australian Territory of Christmas Island. The Australian government, for purely political reasons, closed the port at Christmas Island. When the Tampa arrived and declared an emergency, dozens of troops from Australia's Special Air Service Regiment were commanded to invade the vessel and take control of it. Shortly afterwards, in October 2001, the Howard government falsely accused a different group of asylum seekers of throwing their children overboard in order to force the Navy to rescue them. The entire 2001 election was based on racist hysteria with the Howard government promising to make it even more difficult for Muslim asylum seekers to reach Australia. Bear in mind that this was mere weeks after the destruction of the Twin Towers on September 11, 2001. As part of that process, the government passed privative clauses to try to prevent asylum seekers from being able to challenge immigration decisions. Regardless of your views about refugees and immigration, this was tragically unjust. The accountability mechanism of judicial review was removed from refugee decisions simply because the government wanted to make the process harder. This harmed genuine refugees as well as those with weaker claims. The High Court came to the rescue. 
In a case called Plaintiff S157 in the Commonwealth, the High Court determined that the privative clause only prevented the court from reviewing decisions, whereas if there was a jurisdictional error of law, there was no decision, so the privative clause could not be effective. So while an aggrieved person might be prevented from complaining that a decision was made incorrectly, they can't be prevented from challenging the decision if their allegation is that the decision maker lacked the power to make the decision at all. As a result, there are still bucket loads of migration review decisions every year. The government failed in its attempt to put migration law beyond the jurisdiction of the court. That's the take-home message. Administrative decisions which suffer from jurisdictional error can be challenged in court, despite a privative clause to the contrary. And thank goodness for that, because any government that tries to legislate away your right to challenge administrative decisions is trying to legislate away your basic human rights. Yet again, administrative law is our protection from tyranny. Okay, so now we understand narrow ultra vires and jurisdictional error of law. In the other two videos this week, we're going to be a bit more specific and look at the actual types of error within those categories. See you in the next video.